So welcome to the American Printing House of the Blind Access Academy. It is our fourth out of five webinars in our Come Back to Me Braille series. Does Braille formatting spark joy? Let's see what we find out today and what sparks Kyle and Dawn will be able to ignite in our learning. Well, hello, I am Kyle DeJute and my title at the American Printing House for the Blind. Oh, is... this looks a little funny to me. Oh, just there's me. kind of a lot going on on this slide, kind of yeah. overlapping and messy, huh? It's like a messy bedroom where you can't find anything. Let's try again. My name is Kyle DeJute. My title at the American Printing House for the Blind is Braille Trainer. There's a picture of me up on the screen with my name uh, nicely aligned under it. And the picture shows that I'm a white woman with short brown hair and a giant smile. And you can just see in the background of this photo that in visual Braille, there's the contracted word Braille behind me. And my name is Dawn Edens. I am a digital textbook file developer with the American Printing House for the Blind. And there is also a picture of me. Um, I am also a Caucasian woman with long blondish brown hair and always say a bright welcoming smile. So let's get right down to talking about source documents, which is one of my favorite things to talk about where any braille question is concerned. So our source documents for formatting decisions include, first up, Braille Formats 2016. So this is the Braille formatting document from the Braille Authority of North America that is based in UEB. And its full title is Braille Formats, Principles of Print to Braille Transcription. For our early learners specifically, BANA has published guidelines for the transcription of early educational materials from print to braille. And so when we're transcribing things for our very early learners, we would look first to that document, the guidelines for early educational materials, and where what that does not cover, we can look into Braille Formats 2016 as our source document for braille formatting questions. But wait, there's more. When we're transcribing using UEB with Nemeth, sometimes also called Nemeth within UEB or encapsulated Nemeth. Our first source for formatting information is the Nemeth code. And what the Nemeth code does not cover, we look into Braille Formats 2016 for guidance on. Please remember that the Nemeth code includes all of the updates, the guidance for using Nemeth code within UEB contexts, and, um, and again, all of those updates that apply to the Nemeth code. When we're transcribing using UEB math science, so just UEB, our first place to look for formatting, though there's not a lot in it, is the guidelines for technical material, which is that extension of the rules of UEB, the GTM, guidelines for technical material, is the place that I would say we look first for formatting questions for UEB math science transcriptions. We also would look to BANA's Provisional Guidance for Transcribing Mathematics in UEB. Again, this is a document from the Braille Authority of North America, so it's for the really for the US and Canada. And it gives us some formatting guidance, which we're gonna to touch on later today. If neither of those documents give us an answer to the formatting question that we, that we have, can you guess? Yeah, we go back to Braille Formats 2016 for formatting information. And now it's time for a poll. And our first poll is, what would you say is the purpose of Braille formats or Braille formatting? Is it A, to make the Braille look just like the print, B, to make the Braille transcription more difficult, or C, to make the Braille easier to navigate? Again, what would you say is the purpose of Braille formatting? A, to make the Braille look just like the print, B, to make Braille transcription more difficult, or C, to make the Braille easier to navigate. And right now we have about 70% uh, who have put in an answer that is a wonderful participation. I'm gonna end the polling and share out the results. So Don and Kyle, 
what people answered was to make Braille easier to navigate 90% with a few people who indicated to make the Braille look just like the print. What do we say? Let's talk about it. There are a couple of options there. I appreciate that the vast majority of you said the goal of Braille formatting, the purpose of formatting is to make the Braille easier to navigate. That is also what I would strongly contend. Formatting helps Braille users navigate a document. The textual information might be there without formatting and it can be easier to find and refer back to and categorize if we have the formatting. We suggested in the poll that Braille formatting's purpose might be to make transcription more difficult. And though it can feel that way sometimes as we're trying to wrangle software or our Braille dots into just the right place on the page, that's not the purpose. And even when it is more difficult, I would contend that instead of like rolling a rock up a hill as Sisyphus did, when we do that hard work of braille formatting, we're more building a brick wall, a beautiful structure, maybe a, a brick cabin that's going to last for some time and help to make things easier and more comfortable. In fact, the purpose of braille formatting is not to make the braille look exactly like print because that would be impossible. It's even more different in some ways than comparing apples, oranges, and or bananas because braille has a static cell size, the braille cell always has to be the same size, approximately equal to a print 24 point font. Braille also has static line spacing. The size of the braille cell does not change, so the size of a braille line does not change. Whereas in print, we can just eke a little more space between lines to give a different look, to give different formatting. We can't do that in braille. Similarly, I think a lot of us know Braille has one direction of reading, unlike print where you can have a text box diagonal on the page. You could read print in a circle around the page. We read Braille, we read Unified English Braille from left to right, from the top to the bottom of the page. And print, in contrast, has endless variations of size, spacing, direction of reading. So there's there isn't any way, in fact, that we could make the Braille look just like the print. In fact, Braille, instead of reproducing exactly the look of print, must reproduce exactly, not exactly, but help wants to reproduce print organization. So this includes levels of headings, categories of information, often organized by heading, and extra material. It's both extra because it's outside of the main content of the text and also extra in a sort of recent meaning of the word. It's very extra. It's just over the top. And sometimes it's like a speech bubble from a clown saying, you could see this document also. Uh, Braille, when we format, we look for logical, useful places for those extra materials to go. And so some of, yeah, clues, sorry, clues for Braille navigation of the text. Um, if you have like empty space at the left, that's usually an indicator for you. Um, for headings, it could be a sub item, list, um, answer choice. Now we're gonna do our slideshow formatting from Braille Formats 2016, section 6.13. Slide numbers. Slide numbers are always gonna be equal to your print page number. It's always gonna have your print page number. Each slide gets a print page change indicator or indication. And descriptions are always going to be transcribers notes. They're always going to be included with transcribers notes. Enclose any transcriber generated descriptions in transcribers note indicators. This includes any descriptions taken from electronic alt text. Speakers notes. So speakers notes are something that a person who's building a slideshow can write 
sort of notes for the presenter that don't appear on the slide, but that are part of the electronic file of the slideshow. If those are present when we do a Braille transcription, we include speaker's notes if we have access to them. These speaker's notes in a slideshow are preceded by the word note as an embedded transcriber's note. The word note is the embedded transcriber's note. The speaker's note is formatted in 7.5, and it might look something like this, where we have formatted in 7.5, opening transcriber's note indicator, capital N-O-T-E, then closing transcriber's note indicator, and the actual content of the speaker's note. Confess that you do not use these, Kyle. It's true. I don't use speaker's notes. I'm just here chatting about Braille formats. I don't have uh, reminders to myself about things to say in the slideshow file. But if I did, and we were transcribing this slideshow into Braille, we would include those speaker's notes, just like Braille formats tells us to. When we format slideshows, as with so many formattings, we're looking to create or find a consistent format for the content of the slideshows. Even if the slideshow itself in print isn't perfectly consistent, we're going to look for a way to understand that text in terms of headings, indented or blocked paragraphs, and lists. Stay tuned for talking about some tools in Braille transcription software to format text uh, elements as these kinds of things, headings, paragraphs, and lists. Something we can do anytime we're talking about formatting and Braille Formats 2016 is look for a sample in the Braille Formats 2016. So like good hard boiled detectives, we might go to sample 616 in Braille Formats 2016. And that uh, would give us what's up here on the street screen. We're gonna look at real fast. Our slide number is three. And so that's treated as our print page number placed at the top right of the page. Our heading of the slide is screen reader. And so that's our centered heading in the Braille transcription. Then we have an indented list screen reader with three sub items. And so our screen reader first level entry is formatted in one five and our sub items in three five. That means the first line starts in three and any part of the content that runs over to a new Braille line starts in cell five. Then our next point is TTS is a text reader. That's the next point after that indented list. And that's a, we've treated that as a new list in the transcription. I say we, I mean Braille formats 2016. And what we don't see on the slide itself from the slideshow, but we do see in the additional material for the slide are speakers notes. And those are transcribed as we discussed, formatted in 7.5 with just the word note as a one word embedded transcriber's note at the very beginning, and then the actual content of the speaker's note. Sample 616 goes on to show another slide, which includes a screenshot. And the description of that screenshot is in a transcriber's note. So this is material that is a description of an image and it goes in a transcriber's note. We're not gonna read that description because fortunately or unfortunately, Picture descriptions are not why we're here today. But please let me draw your attention to the fact that uh, we have a print page change, which indicates the slide change. And now it's time for another poll. This is poll number two. And in a slide presentation, each slide number is A, formatted as a centered heading, B is treated as the print page number. Again, um, I will repeat that for poll number two. In a slide presentation, each slide number is A, formatted as a center heading, or B, treated as the print page number. We have some quick thinking attendees in our audience today, because already we are up to 60%. We love it when you put an answer in the chat and tell us what you're thinking. I will go ahead and end it here at 63% and share. So Kyle and Dawn, the a question was in a slide presentation, each slide number 
94% said is treated as the print page number. Yay, <laughs> that is correct. It is treated as a print page number. Exactly. Sometimes when we need something to be a specific format, it can feel like all I wanna do is get my hands on it. I just wanna be like a potter at a pottery wheel and I wanna do six key entry to get exactly the format that I want. So let's talk about six key entry. What is six key entry, Kyle? It's simply using six keys to type braille. The most classic example of six key entry is typing on a Perkins braille writer, which has those six keys that correspond to the six dots of the braille cell. And where do we use six key entry? Like we said, very classically, we use six key entry on the Perkins Braille Writer. We also use that same six key entry setup, uh, sometimes for input on refreshable Braille displays. The online series of Braille modules at uebonline.org uses six key entry. And the programs that are appropriate for using to complete the National Library Services Instruction Manual for Braille Transcribing also use six key entry. Those are Perky Duck and Braille Zephyr. And how does six key entry work like on a QWERTY keyboard? So we use traditionally the letters S, D, F and J, K, L as the parallels to the Perkins Braille Writer six keys. So those letters correspond to the six dots of the cell where S is dot one, B is dot two, sorry, F is dot one, D is dot two, and S as in Sierra is dot three. J would be dot four and K dot five, L dot six. In order to use a QWERTY keyboard, so the QWERTY keyboard is the traditional print keyboard where the first letters in the top row of letters are Q, W, E, R, T, Y, QWERTY. In order to type six key entry, we type multiple keys at once. The software program that we're doing six key entry in then interprets that multi key press at once as instruction to insert a corresponding ASCII character. So it's a little different from the way that our braille cell gets built physically by pins that correspond mechanically to the keys on a Perkins keyboard. When we do six key entry into a software program, that program interprets our multiple keys pressing at once as a sort of shortcut to insert an ASCII character that corresponds to a braille cell configuration. So for example, the CH contraction, which is dots one and six, we would press letters F and L simultaneously and the software program would insert the ASCII character asterisk because that's the ASCII character that corresponds to the braille cell configuration dots one six. We did talk more specifically and in depth about ASCII and braille in the first session of this come back to me braille series that's maps for the braille adventure. When we push multiple keys at once on a keyboard, some keyboards um, will try and protect us thinking that we've fallen asleep and our head is at the keyboard or a cat has walked across the keyboard or a child is mashing at the keyboard. And those keyboards won't allow for N key rollover. They interpret each key press individually instead of interpreting them all as one entry. Uh, what we want, what we want is for our keyboard to interpret all of those key presses together. That's how we give the shortcut information to the software program. And so what we need is N key rollover. The uebonline.org that we talked about a moment ago does provide a keyboard test to see if your keyboard can do six key entry. So if you create a free and no commitment profile on uebonline.org, you can get access to their online keyboard test to see if your keyboard can do six key entry. And now it's time for another poll. This is poll number three. So which program do you 
do you use most often to transcribe Braille? Would it be Braille Blaster, Braille 2000, Duxbury Braille Translator, or any other? Again, I'll read those again. Which program do you use most often to transcribe Braille? Would it be A, Braille Blaster, B, Braille 2000, C, Duxbury, or D, any other? And we are very intrigued to know what it is that you use most often. We do ask that if you select other, that right now there's four of you that have selected other, we would love to know what that is. Please drop it into the chat um, so that we know what you're using. You never know when we might learn something new. At 70%, I love the participation today. I'm going to end the polling and share out. And so Kyle and Don, 75% um, of our viewers here today who responded are using Duxbury. However, we do have Braille Blaster being used by 12%, Braille 2000 at 9%. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing everybody. And there are a bunch of different ways to transcribe. There's no right or wrong answer for that. Um, you can use whatever software fits your needs. In any Braille transcription software that you use, if it's not six key entry, then the formatting is based on styles. And what is a style and why should I even care if I have a style applied to something? <laughs> a style is information about what a text element is. So when we apply a style or when a style has been applied to some chunk of text, it tells the software program, this chunk of text or text element is a heading, a certain kind of heading perhaps, a paragraph, a certain kind of paragraph, perhaps. A list, a certain level of list, perhaps. A style gives software programs information about what a text element is. Print appearance can be generated from styles. Uh, very traditionally, our headings that are in a certain style are usually a different color and often a larger font size. And our things that are styled, our text elements that are styled as a paragraph are a usually black and a smaller font size. Braille transcription programs generate formatting based on styles. So in theory, if we called something a speaker's note as a style, remember when we talked about slideshows like Google slideshows or PowerPoints that we might be transcribing into Braille, if we applied if there were something called speaker's note style, then that would put what we styled as what text element we applied speaker's note to would be formatted in 7.5 with the word note as an embedded transcriber's note at its beginning. And of course, screen readers use styles for what? Navigation. And these are the examples of some styles in Braille Blaster. Um, if you're not familiar with Braille Blaster, I'll give you a quick rundown. When you open Braille Blaster, it's going to have all of your styles over in your left hand, far left hand column. And then in the middle is going to be your print column or where you type in what you're wanting to transcribe. And then your third view of this has your Braille output of what you are writing in print. And as you can see on this one, it did have Zola and it's got it as a centered heading. And then also it has it in Braille over in your last window or to the far right. Let's talk about Braille transcription software programs. We talked theoretically about styles. Let's just say a few words about the three most common transcription softwares in the US. And those are Braille Blaster, of course, Braille 2000, and as most of you had selected, Duxbury Braille Translator. And the first one we're going to talk about is Braille Blaster. And the reason this is a very popular program, it is free, totally free, no cost, nothing. Um, and as you can see, again, it does when you open Braille Blaster, 
it has your three different viewings. So it's got your styles over to the far left. Then in the middle is your print where you're gonna type, you're gonna type in what you're wanting to transcribe into Braille. And the Braille is gonna show up to the far right. Sometimes Braille Blaster can be referred to as BB, um, and that's capital BB for Braille Blaster. It has been criticized only for its development bugs. And the reason that is, it's a newer software program developed by APH. And um, when those bugs do come out, our software team is on it and they're getting those fixed. Um, it does have separated editing tools. So if you want a six key entry, you do have to push either like F6 or you can go under your editing bar and then scroll down to where it says six key entry. And then also for ASCII math. It's beloved because it's free. If I haven't mentioned that before, totally free. Um, it's side by side view where it does have the styles, your print and your braille. And a big popular thing also with this is the conversion of NIMAS files. It can take any NIMAS file that has been converted and it's gonna already have, if it has any math markup in it, any text element styles, that's all gonna translate over into Braille Blaster. So you won't have to apply that. And Braille Blaster isn't the only Braille transcription software. There's Braille 2000, um, which we see a quick screenshot of Braille 2000 in action here. It's got a central window for working in, which can show both print and Braille. The uh, print or Braille can be shown on the whole page, and then there can be one line at a time of the reverse. And over at the left, there's a series of buttons for applying styles and performing other transcription actions. Braille 2000 sometimes is referred to as B2K, right, where the K is 1000, so it's Braille 2000 B2K. Sometimes this program has been criticized for its lack of accessibility. And there is now a talking edition of Braille 2000. So there are multiple different editions of Braille 2000 and they have each have different features. One of them includes verbalization of actions on the screen, obviously, and also the Braille text even can be read as narrative text instead of just cell by cell. Some, uh, historically, Braille 2000 has been criticized for its slow development. Uh, at many times, Braille 2000 has had just one person working, and design, working on it and designing it. So it does take a little bit longer sometimes for changes to happen in Braille 2000 than they do in some of the other transcription programs. Braille 2000 is really beloved for its speed Braille keys. So right on board in Braille 2000, there's a way to record shortcuts. Maybe you call them macros. And those are called speed Braille keys. They can be easily mapped to a simple key press to do a series of actions that you do again and again in the software. Braille 2000 has been beloved for its color coding on the screen. It's a, a quick and efficient visual appearance for transcription. Braille 2000 has a really hands-on editing feel, and those who use it often really like this feeling of having their hands on the Braille as they make adjustments in contractions and formatting. And last but not least, clearly not least in our conversation today, since so many of you use Duxbury Braille Translator is another Braille transcription software. This is often referred to as Dux, simply Duxbury instead of Duxbury Braille Translator and DBT. The program has been criticized for its non-intuitive editing tools. So unlike Braille 2000, you can transcribe in Duxbury without getting your cursor sort of on the Braille. There are some significant aspects of Duxbury Braille Translator that require coding, a sort of coding knowledge and coding thought process, C-O-D-I-N-G, coding. Some of Duxbury's 
not perfectly intuitive editing tools include the fact that the print files and braille files in Duxbury Braille Translator aren't connected in the way that they are in Braille 2000 and Braille Blaster. So when you work in a print file in Duxbury Braille Translator, you can generate a Braille file from that. And once you do, that Braille file is based on what was in the print and is a representation of that. But if you make a change in that Braille file that was born from the print file, no change happens in the corresponding print file. Similarly, once a Braille file has been born from a Duxbury print file, any change to that print does not have an effect on the existing Braille file. So the print and Braille files in Duxbury Braille Translator are not continuously connected. Duxbury has been criticized for its price. Many times it is the more expensive option of these three that we're talking about. The program is beloved for its breadth of translation tables. There are literally hundreds of translation tables. So hundreds of options for how your print corresponds to a braille code. And not just English braille codes, but braille codes for lots of different languages, as well as selections of contractions. Duxbury uh, can be beloved for its international presence. It has a breadth of reach. Duxbury also has been beloved for its bridge between word processing software and the Duxbury Braille translator. So the way that Duxbury is set up, one can do a lot of work in Microsoft Word, which is a multi-billion dollar program. And the work done in Microsoft Word can then be used to generate a Braille file in Duxbury. So you can try out any of these programs with a free download. The download for Braille Blaster is the full and complete download because Braille Blaster is free. There's a link on this screen for that. It's braillebluster.org slash download. You can also download a trial or evaluation version of Braille 2000. You can download an evaluation version of any of the editions of Braille 2000 and try that out for free. You just can't use it for production. You can't generate a finalized Braille file using this evaluation version. And the same thing is true for Duxbury. You can download any of the versions of Duxbury that are available, which include a separate program for Windows and a separate program for Mac. You can play around with the functionality of the program in the trial session, but you can't produce a finished Braille file. So you could download and try any of those programs. noticed a bunch of notes in the chat. Should we bring up some of those? I did. I was um, writing back to them. So if you all have questions on Braille Blaster, please feel free to reach out to me. I did include my email in the chat and I think it went to the all panelists and attendees. Um, so any Braille Blaster questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll be glad to answer anything. Uh, I'll just jump in real quick. We have an update coming out uh, it's supposed to come out today. If it doesn't come out today, it'll be Monday or Tuesday. Uh, there is a bug. Uh, Mac put out a, an update of their operating system that now causes uh, Braille Blaster to not launch. It's an issue. It's an incompatibility between our user interface and their uh, operating system. And Thanks, we've updated our uh, the the thing that runs our user interface. So it'll be better and we'll have, this won't happen again for, Ten, give it 10 or 15 years and it'll happen again. Right. <laughs> but it, it will be covered for a long time. So okay. look for that update for your Mac issues. And if you have any issues, email Dawn and uh, we'll work together to, to get your issues resolved. I, I have to jump off, but thanks so much. Thanks, William. I appreciate it. Thanks for that update. Right. Bye, y'all. All right. Braille okay. transcription softwares are fascinating, but let's talk about headings. Cutting and right, formatting. So, and this is Braille Formats 2016, Section 4 of the Braille Formats. Heading levels. Of course, there's a centered heading. That's going to be a first level heading. And then also you can have a cell 5, which is a second level heading, sometimes referred to as second level heading. And then the other one is a cell 7, which can be also considered a third level heading. 
The majority of the time, you're going to choose centered headings. Those break up any material more plainly than the other heading types. And that's because of all of that white space or negative space around a centered heading that makes it stand out to your Braille reader. Some print requires the distinction of cell five and cell seven headings. So you do want to pay attention to those, but most of the time you're going to be using your centered heading. I'm going to do what my sister says I do and push up my nerd glasses to talk about math formatting. We're going to do some pretty quick summaries here, but we couldn't let it go without touching on some math formatting. Specifically for UEB math science, the BANA guidance on transcribing mathematics using UEB exhorts us to use indented paragraphs all the time instead of blocked paragraphs. We just use indented paragraphs. Of course, our spatial material, so like an addition problem that's arranged, arranged spatially for calculation, has to have a blank line before and after it. And generally, we follow Braille Formats 2016 for formatting concerns in a UEB math science transcription. How's that for a quick summary? On the other side of the coin, a transcription using UEB with Nemeth. Also, the Nemeth code exhorts us to use indented paragraphs all the time. So any paragraph from print is gonna be indented. We're not gonna have any blocked braille paragraphs in a UEB with Nemeth transcription. Spatial material, problems arranged spatially for calculation and or fractions arranged spatially for instruction get a blank line before and after each problem. There are in a UEB with Nemeth transcription, two types of displayed material. When the material being displayed is technical, is it is mathematical or scientific, we follow the Nemeth code rules for displaying material. So that's no blank lines and indented two cells to the right of the runover of the preceding material. For displayed literary material in a UEB with Nemeth transcription, we follow Braille formats 2016. So that's gonna be our blank line before and after and the adjusted left margin based on the surrounding material. There are in my collection of flashcard folders on Quizlet, two flashcard sets that touch on formatting for math transcriptions. One of them is called UEB Technical Math Science Formats, and the other is UEB with Nemeth Formats. So if you go to the Braille Trainer collection of folders, you can find those flashcard sets, and I hope they're useful. And now it's time for another poll. I think this is poll number four, I'm going to say. And true or false, is it best to have lots of cell seven or cell five headings and fewer centered headings as possible? Would you say that's true or false? Is it best to have lots of self seven or cell five headings and fewer centered headings? A is true and B is false. We're gonna give just a moment for those who are using uh, screen readers, voiceover to allow their device to speak this out for them. And I apologize for the typo that is in the, if you're seeing the pop-up poll, uh, the typo that's in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this out and I'm gonna share out the results. Dawn, we had 64% who said that it was false. That is correct. You do want to use more centered headings um, as again, those will give you that or that whoever is reading the Braille, that extra white space or the blank space in the left. So they can identify whether it's a list, a heading, and they don't have to keep going all the way to the right further to read. All right, headings. I like headings. Type forms. Sometimes I love type forms. Let's talk about them. What is a type form, Kyle? 
I don't understand what it is. Yeah, it's a weird braille specific yeah. word. In print, so I'm quoting from the uh, instruction manual for braille transcribing, when special typefaces, which are often referred to as font attributes, that's a reasonable, uh, that's a reasonable synonym for type form. These font attributes, such as italics, boldface, underlining, or script, when those are used to, I, to emphasize or to make distinct a word or passage, these changes must be so indicated in Braille. So a type form in most ways is a font attribute. Our italics, boldface, underlining, and script, those are the type forms for which Rules of UEB gives us pre-made type form indicators. To this quote, I did add the highlighting and the bold. Here's a transcription of that previous slide, and I want to draw your attention to a couple of places where a type form is being used. So for the words font attributes, we transcribed the bold by using a bold word indicator for the word font and a bold word indicator for the word attributes. The effect of that bold word indicator for the attributes, which comes which is followed immediately by a closing parenthesis. The effect of the bold word indicator is allowed to simply expire with the space that follows after the symbols sequence, bold word attributes, close parentheses. Another type form that we've used in this transcription is the three cell guy here that's dot four, dots three, four, five, six, and dots two, three, five, six. So the dots two, three, five, six tells us this is a passage and our dot four, dots three, four, five, six is the first transcriber defined type form indicator. For this transcription of this, uh, for this transcription, I have defined this type form as yellow highlighting. So if I were producing an, a final product for this braille, I would have a special symbols page or other way of identifying this dot four, dot three, four, five, six means yellow highlighting. And our passage of that extends through the words italics, comma, boldface, comma, underlining, comma, or script. And then finally, we terminate our first transcriber defined type form indicator, which here we mean yellow highlighting. And last but not least, down in the attribution, which is dash cap less than 15 of the, we have an underlining passage here, the words NLS instruction manual for braille transcribing, that's all underlined and that helps us know there is a link there. So we have an opening underline passage indicator, that's 4562356. And then at the end of our three or more symbols sequences, we have our type form terminator. That's dots four, five, six, three. And we did have a question, Kyle. It says, so that would be on a transcriber's note page? Correct. The identification of a transcriber defined type form indicator is most often on the special symbols page. Very infrequently, there will be just one section, maybe one print page on which a type form is used. And in that case, we might define the transcriber defined type form immediately before that one small island in a larger project where it's used. But the special symbols page is a great place for definition of any transcriber defined type form. Thank you, Kyle. And how do you tell if it's a symbol, you're gonna use like a symbol, a word or a passage indicator? How do you know? So a symbol is one letter, one print sign. Even if it takes multiple braille cells to transcribe, we can still have one symbol. So for example, the lowercase letter I standing alone is a symbol. The capital I takes up two braille cells to transcribe and it is still one letter. So it is still a symbol. Our letter K standing alone needs a grade one symbol indicator before it so that it isn't the word knowledge. And so it takes two braille cells to transcribe our lowercase K standing alone. But it's still one letter, it is one symbol. Same thing for our capital K. 
and the numeral four takes two Braille cells to transcribe the numeric indicator and dots one, four, five, but it is one number, so it is one symbol. Kyle, we did have a quick question. It looks like, um, if I can interrupt you for a second, I'm sorry. It says, would you put in parentheses after the transcriber defined and it's got it in parentheses in the chat. So I think that's a question about the transcriber defined type form indicator. And so when we're identifying that on a special symbols page, we simply give what that type form means. It is not necessary to specify that it is a transcriber defined type form indicator. When we're making decisions about indicators, we often need to think about whether something is a symbol or a word. For purposes of type forms, a word is a symbols sequence or a symbols word. We did talk about symbols sequences in the second session of this series, bridging the river Y. So I'm not gonna go real deep into how we define a symbols sequence. It's bookended by uh, spaces. And if you want to go back and watch the recording of Bridging the River Y, you certainly can, and I encourage it. So here we have some examples of words. When we're thinking about type forms, a, sim a word is a symbols sequence. So DOG or 457. That's more than one digit. It's not a symbol, the 457. It is a word, right? So there's a space, the number is 457, and then another space. And also mother hyphen in hyphen law for purposes of type form indicators, mother hyphen in hyphen law is a word. We would use the word indicator because mother hyphen in hyphen law is a symbols sequence. A passage is more than two symbols sequences. A passage is three or more symbols sequences. So this is cool, cap this space is space cool space is a symbols sequence. It is three, sorry, it's not a symbol sequence. This is cool is a passage. Uh, a comma B comma C comma it, with spaces between the commas and the letters is a passage. So three or more symbols sequences is a passage. The UEB study group Google Drive includes a document called QK list or quick list, UEB signs and symbols. This uh, gives a easy to read and refer to print chart of indicators for type forms. And actually the full chart includes indicators for grade one and uh, capitalization as well. So that's a cool, it's a pretty cool cheat sheet overall. And this particular chart within it at the bottom of page two gives a nice visual layout of the type form indicators that are available to us. It is really good. I use mine all the time. <laughs> if I'm transcribing something, I refer to it quite a bit. Yeah, it's pretty chock full. Yes. Should we keep to ignore? That is the question. When should we ignore a type form? We should ignore a type form if the formatting distinguishes the material just as the type form does. So if we have a quotation that's indented, that's displayed, and the whole quotation is italicized, there's no reason to keep both the italics and the displaying formatting. We must keep the displayed format and we can ignore the italics, which emphasize that material in just the same way that the formatting does. Sometimes multiple type forms apply to the same material all for the same reason. So in an earlier slide, there was material that was both underlined and highlighted, and there was no link for the underlined text. So we chose only to retain the highlighting. It just was there to make it look extra super pretty in print, but we only needed to emphasize it for one reason. So we would keep a type form if it sparks joy. I just couldn't resist saying spark joy again. I would say sparking joy means it gives additional information. So we keep a type form if it gives additional information about the emphasized or type formed material. Again, relevant information equals joy. 
print appearance and just looking pretty, giving us information that we already have from somewhere else, not joy, toss it out. And now it's time, I think for our final poll, since we have about, um, it looks like about seven minutes left. Um, there are different formatting rules for a UEB with Nimitz transcription than for a UEB or UEB math science transcription. Would you say that this is A, true or B, false? Again, there are different formatting rules for a UEB with Nimitz transcription than one for a UEB or UEB math science transcription. Again, A is true and B is false. We will give uh, a few more moments for you to answer that question. Allow your screen reader voiceover to catch up. So wondering if there is a difference in formatting because we are short on time, six minutes left. I'm gonna end the polling and share out. And so, well, we have some answers for both, but 82% said true that there is a difference in formatting rules. That is correct. It is true. Good job. Let's give a quick bit of information about indented and blocked paragraphs. Indented paragraphs are the ones that have the first line pushed over to the right of it. Blocked paragraphs have every line of the paragraph starting at the same left margin. Blocked paragraphs need a bit of vertical space before them in order to separate them. Otherwise, you couldn't tell the end of one paragraph from the beginning of the next. When do we ignore print? for paragraph indention. There's this rule that transcribers love to argue about, uh, about when we can ignore print blocked paragraphs and just use indented paragraphs in Braille. If a whole print project has only blocked paragraphs, then, and only then, we can substitute indented paragraphs for the whole thing. So this is a Braille formats rule. This is separate from uh, any discussion of math formatting where BANA and the Nemeth code exhort us to use indented paragraphs all the time. If we're talking about a literary transcription, Braille formats 2016 tells us if the whole print project has only blocked paragraphs, then we can substitute indented paragraphs for all of those blocked paragraphs. This is the whole print project, not just one chunk of displayed material or one chapter it has to be the whole print project, the whole book, or the whole series. Um, and we're skipping this last poll. Um, so we can I'll just tell you the answer. Questions. Okay. We would use an italic symbol indicator for the letter I if it were italicized. If it were emphasized, the letter I only gets a symbol indicator for its type form because it's just one letter. Next time we get together will be Friday, March 5th. That's for the webinar Navigation of Braille Certification. And like today, that's gonna to take place from one to two Eastern time on Friday, March 5th. So not next Friday, but Friday after that. So we hope that you will uh, check your calendars and save the date for our fifth and final in the series. Um, on the screen, we have Kyle's email address and Dawn's email address again. We will drop that into the chat so you have access to it. There might be a few questions that we'll circle back to in a moment, so stay with us if you would like that. But I just wanted to uh, get things ready to close up just to be able to say thank you to Kyle and Dawn. You always share a wealth of information. I walk away learning so many things that I had no idea that existed about Braille. So I appreciate that, So I, and I know that others do as well. So just wanted to say thank you.